All right, welcome back to the podcast. I am joined today with Robert Sapolsky. He is a world-renowned neuroscientist, primatologist, um, has written some amazing books, some of which I use in my IOP partial, including Why Zebras Have Ulcers. He has a new book on, it's called Determined. Here we go. And um, he has a couple other books that we'll dive into as well. I'm joined with Alex Horwitz. He was on prior episode on serotonin syndrome. And um, thanks guys for coming on. Sure. Thank you for having me. So I was fascinated uh, to learn that you were writing primatologists when you were at a very young age. I think you said around 12. And I'm curious as an adult, how you imagine you found this fascination? Um, in the American Museum of Natural History, uh, sort of in my experience, field biologists, majority of them grew up somewhere exotic. Their parents were missionaries or researchers or who knows what. And then there are those of us who at some point in our urban settings stumbled into the Natural History Museum and couldn't believe that there's another place out there. And in my case, it was the primate exhibit hall at uh, the museum and something clicked and I decided I wanted to live inside those dioramas. And so I imagine, you know, as you went through and you went through, you know, college and graduate school and what a huge culture shock that must have been from going from these like the most prestigious institutions to like Africa being on the field with baboons. Tell me about that. Well, um, I think prestige was not so much the issue as when I first started doing field work a couple of weeks after college out in Kenya. Um, at that point, I had been in the New York to Boston axis and Philadelphia a couple of times, and that was about it. And I knew nothing about anything in the world out there. And I probably would have felt just as much of an alien trying to understand things if I had been plunked down in the middle of Iowa, but it happened to be the Serengeti instead. And, you know, I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. I don't, one, one thing that like, as I read your, the mem memoir of that you wrote about your, your baboons is you talked about how all of a sudden you realized you were being conned at times. And I was thinking about how, what that experience was like and how that changed you. Um, well, it changed me slowly, which is to say I was incredibly naive and vulnerable. Uh, my very first day, uh, I had come from the airport in Nairobi and was waiting to figure out like how to get to the YMCA, which is where I stayed initially. And I was on the grounds of the museum, the National Museum in Nairobi. And some guy gave me an incredibly heartbreaking, convincing pitch about how he was a Ugandan refugee. Uh, history trivia, this was during the period when Idi Amin was dictator of Uganda next door to Kenya. And he was a refugee and fighting for Ugandan freedom from Idi Amin. And could I help him? And I helped him and gave him like half my money and all of that. Uh -huh. I proceeded like for years afterward, I would see that guy in the museum grounds being a recently escaped Ugandan refugee. So it was sort of downhill from there. I was very, very naive. Yeah, it's a, it's a wake up call, I imagine. It kind of helped you in the U.S. as well, because um, I think we it, it happens. It's just more subtle, right? It's... <laughs> well, it's um, I'm still pretty useless on both fronts and uh, detecting things like that. So tell tell me about your th your initial thoughts on the dominance hierarchy, and, and which seemed to be very evident. There was like, and then how that changed over time. Well. You know, baboons, these are savanna baboons uh, out in the grasslands, and they live in these big social groups, 50 to 100 animals or so. And all they do is be like 
socially complex with each other. Serengeti is an amazing setting if you're a baboon because you can do your days feeding, foraging in about three hours, which means you've got almost all day to devote to being socially you know, Machiavellian with other baboons and their their miserable, backstabbing, conniving sort of maneuvers, which turned out to be perfect for what I was studying. Um, they're also, at the time, the textbook example of here's a closely related primate species, which in which it is male dominated, hierarchical, very stratified, high rates of aggression, violence, highest rates among non human primates. And well, this is what they're like. And you sure are impressed with number one in the hierarchy, and maybe a little bit less so with two, and then all the way down there. And hierarchy and all of that was like the center organizing feature of these guys lives until how to turn until it turned out not to be so much um this was what i had gone out to do is study i was like turning into a stress physiologist and was figuring out ways to dart to anesthetize wild baboons get blood samples and do dex suppression tests on them ultimately and things like that and what i was interested in is what does your social rank have to do with how well your body's dealing with stress your cholesterol levels your cortisol levels your immune profiles, all of that. And I went in with an absolutely clear picture as to what I was guessing was going to be the case, which is if you get a choice in the matter, you want to be a high ranking baboon because low ranking ones were like textbook examples of psychological stress, lack of control, lack of predictability, lack of outlets. And they had elevated basal cortisol levels. They had trouble turning off their stress response. They had all sorts of other things that looked bad for them. And ultimately, it seemed like this one big blowout of like, hooray for social dominance. And I proceeded to waste my first 20 years researching the baboons doing that, deciding I understood what was going on and what turned out to be far more interesting was patterns of socialization and personality personality which is not remotely an anthropomorphic term when you're talking about other primates and you know as a soundbite it took me decades and probably no longer being a 20 year old and a 40 year old instead to figure out if you got a choice in the matter and you want to have low blood pressure uh, and you could be a high-ranking male baboon or one who has a lot of grooming relationships, go for the latter every single time. That was far more of an important variable in making sense of baboon behavioral psychology. So when you're going back and forth between like the savanna and the, you know, academia, are you also noticing a dominance hierarchy in academia or well, eventually it was mighty interesting going to my first faculty meeting and sizing up everybody's canines and how long and sharp they were, weren't. Yeah, it gives you certainly insights into human dominance. It certainly emphasizes all the ways in which we are exactly the same and all the ways in which we are amazingly different and where those continua wind up being uh, not quite of a continuum and such yeah i kind of look at things differently at the same time i like sit in a movie theater and somebody comes walking past and i look at their rear end and try to calculate how much anesthetic i would need in the blowgun to take them down if i had to so it's 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 uh infested my daily perception of the world here in lots of interesting ways you know, as a as a therapist, I couldn't help but see this this honestly refreshing moment where you talked about this fantasy of aggression um, towards a professor who was walking by um, one day. Is that like a dominance hierarchy thing too, or what? What, what do you think is behind that? Um, no, that was that was just sheer perversity. This was in grad school. <laughs> 
Rockefeller <laughs> University in Manhattan. There was like a student dorm on campus. I lived on the first floor and like, like clockwork every day, this guy, Fritz Lippmann, who Nobel laureate, who was like in his eighties then and discovered like half of like modern biochemistry. And he would sort of like shuffle past on the way to his lab in his running shoes. And I could not like repress the desire to dart him just because I could, and I was <laughs> learning how to do that at the time. And, but I managed to repress actually doing that, but that was, that was sort of an irresistible urge at the time. So you, you chose to, to not dart him? I chose not to dart him. And besides, I knew my aim wasn't very good at that point and I would just get okay. in trouble. And like, I was Okay. unsteady enough on my feet with my phd advisor so i i didn't i was watching your um your interview with joe rogan and i've i've seen quite of his in quite a number of his interviews but the way that he's sitting with you is different than he sits with other interviewees he was really? more yeah oh yeah he was more um submissive i don't know if you you got to look back at this um but i think i observed that because he is such a fan of your work, you know, and he loves apes, right? And so I could see like a unique shift in the dominance hierarchy that usually manifests. That's remarkable. I could not possibly have been more than a more of a hypogonadal male around Joe Rogan than <laughs> anyone on earth. That's that's <laughs> remarkable to hear about. <laughs> well, um, testosterone only makes you fight down right not fight up is that what you say <laughs> yes yes exactly yeah. he seemed nice enough i i had never heard of the guy at the time but he's like a good guy to hang out with and talk with for a while so uh i guess i'll have to go and look at that again so it sounded like you made this paradigm shift where you realize the baboons are happier if they have more affiliation they're grooming more um did this change the way that you interact as a human to see this well it's one of those i mean that that's kind of what i was learning there and in sort of my lab nine months of the year i spent about 30 years going back and forth between the two i was learning about how bad cortisol was for your brain and like nuts and bolts neuron death and things of that sort and what came out of it was, you know, some very, very clear lessons about the damaging effects of stress, especially chronic psychosocial stress, the importance of psychosocial buffering and all that sort of thing. And it gave me all sorts of insights, which I've spent decades ignoring entirely. Um, um, like such a great example of like being able to lecture about a topic day after day and pay absolutely no attention to whatever I'm talking about. You know, why else are you going to spend 40 years studying stress, 80 hours a week in your lab and things like that, if you're not like miserable at handling it. So I've managed to gain essentially no personal benefit from my science at all over the years. I don't know. It seemed like this uh, epiphany coincided with you getting married, if I like remember in the book correctly. I don't. Maybe I'm just pairing this together. I... No, that was that was not by chance. Um, it has struck more than a few people, including me, as ironic that I had spent about twenty summers living alone in a tent in the Serengeti, finding out how important socialization was for your health. So that that bit of uh incongruity was certainly occurring to me now and then yeah i finally stopped being a sub-adult primate and met someone wonderful beyond words and best of all she wound up spending eight seasons out in my tent with me before like life got more complicated than that in terms of skipping out and like sitting there for a large part of each year um so yeah i think that's kind of around the time that i got enough frontal cortical function that i could perceive <laughs> that you know just dissing someone in like some dominance hierarchy was not really the way to go anymore beautiful um okay so i had this 
like as you talk about this and the more you talk about it, it's like I start to feel this like strong attachment that you had with this tribe of baboons and just following them every day and being with them. Um, but there were some like moments of just pain that you felt, especially around the um, tuberculoid meat given out to, or you know, there was there were cows that had tuberculosis, but it was the kind that's transferred. You have to eat it, and so they would they would slay these cows locally and get, feed the um, humans the meat. But then they would leave some of these scraps, and some of the some of your baboons found this. Um, and I'm I'm wondering, like, I guess I guess I just want to say it, it, it was just absolutely horrific that this happened. I know at one point in the book you're like, ah, I shouldn't have felt this way. I shouldn't have felt bad because you know, like all of the tragedies in the world, right? Um, but it did seem like pretty monumental. It uh, well, let's frame it that I'm I'm privileged enough in every possible way in my life to have been really really devastated by this. Um, like this is what <laughs> counts as like trauma and loss in in uh, sort of world of my luck and such. Yeah, the baboons got tuberculosis, and anyone who has like forced themselves to read, you know, Magic Mountain and Thomas Mann, it goes on for hundreds and hundreds of pages, and it's agonizingly boring and wordy. Like humans malinger for years and years with the tuberculosis. TB works differently in non-human primates. It's wildfire. It kills you in two to three weeks and it spreads to everybody who's within like sneezing difference of distance of you. And this was, you know, some very developing world corruption. Uh, there was a tourist lodge near me and a big staff quarters and the butcher for the staff quarters uh, was being bribed by the locals to approve <laughs> tubercular cows uh for sale and he would like slaughter them and get rid of all the unseemly organs that might tell you that something was amiss um by tossing them out to the nearby baboons who did a lot of scavenging this wasn't my troop but it was the troop next door a couple of miles away and before it was over with half my study subjects had died of tb and i sure got to learn what tubercular lungs look like yeah, I think um, it just the the revulsion and disgust that you must have felt in the whole the whole thing and just the loss. I think it's I, I think of course of course you felt loss. I mean these were like your these were like your children. How much time you spent with them, right? Um, yeah. yeah, it it left an impact. Yeah, and I understand so your troop eventually came over and, and started eating it, but it was mostly the alpha males that did it. And then, so it kind of changed the makeup of the troop for a long time afterwards. Is that, correct? you know, it's, it's one of those, you know, making lemonade out of like necrotic lungs just to really get a unpleasant <laughs> image. Um, but as it happened, the neighboring troop was, had this tourist lodge, which is like, heaven if you're a baboon because you spend all day long like terrorizing tourists on the on the veranda there and snatching their food and these baboons this neighboring troop was living off of the garbage dump there every day a tractor came out and dumped the leftovers from last night's dinner baboons lived off of that and what was fascinating i i did some studies on that troop they got borderline insulin resistant they got the start of metabolic syndrome they were eating a westernized diet um on the other hand infant survival was better it was like one big blowout adventure and the pluses and minuses of a westernized diet um but in any case they're there eating the food scraps and you know word gets out a couple of miles away to my troop that these guys have like the garbage dump every morning and it would turn out that half a dozen or so of my guys would pick up in the morning and head over to that dump and punch it out with a dozen or so local males to get some of the meat so who were these guys doing it by definition if they were going to go off and fight with like outnumbered to get some of the 
dessert leftovers and such. These were my males who were most aggressive. Um, not necessarily high ranking, wasn't correlated with that. And very often the most aggressive male baboon out there is some idiot adolescent who's just like taking on guys. He shouldn't go anywhere near. Yeah. Um, so these were the most aggressive individuals and mourning is when baboons do most of their like social gossiping and sitting around and grooming and cementing relationships. So these guys were not only aggressive, they were the least socially affiliated. They were the ones who were most willing to pick up and skip out on all of that and go fight for leftovers. So when the TB spread to them, it wasn't just random, which of my guys got killed. Um, if you were aggressive, if you didn't care much about social grooming, you died. And anyone else whose personality was very different from that survived. And in the aftermath, you know, lost half these males. So suddenly there's a two to one female to male ratio, which is not normally the case with baboons. And the males who were left were, well, just to get a little little jargony were like nice guys they were they didn't displace aggression on females when they were in a bad mood they they actually groomed somebody in addition to being expected to being groomed hours each day and this totally transformed sort of the social milieu of the tribe um if you will and among other things being low ranking in that troop suddenly was no longer associated with elevated cortisol levels and i even did some work on like endogenous benzodiazepine levels in these guys and that changed as well and it showed you a highly aggressive male dominated hierarchical structure was not inevitable in this species at all it defaulted into something very different from that yeah it kind of it kind of um i don't know like maybe i'm drawing lines here that aren't here but when i think about a lot of your books and writings since the way that i see it is you're trying to create an argument for a culture in which we're more humane more giving to the you know the people who have unfortunate circumstances um, re reduce any judgment towards people, you know, lower on the totem pole. And I think it's almost like I see you trying to not construct a rigid dominance hierarchy, but more like, how do we, how do you, you being more at the top of the dominance hierarchy, whether you like it or not, like, how do you talk about the world and talk about, you know, aggression in such a way that might lead to a more compassionate reality? Well, it certainly could lead to the hopes for, but in lots of ways, what what I took away from the baboons, um, and it's it's very, very significant that you mentioned the word culture, uh, because these baboons developed a unique social culture in this troop. Culture, oh my God, anthropomorphic again. No, this is a very relevant term for lots of other species. It's non-genetic transmission of a trait transgenerationally or within generation to other individuals blah blah male baboons their social system is such that they get bored out of their mind with everyone familiar at puberty they pick up and they go wander and they find some other troop that they now like pursue their fortunes in and this culture lasted for more than 15 years or so mm. such that all of the surviving nice guys from the TB outbreak back when were long gone and forgotten 15 years later as new adolescent males who had grown up in like the big bad like normal baboon world out there joined it took them about six months to assimilate this new social scott style and it was being transmitted mm. they would show up in this troop and in effect would learn we don't do crap like that here, cut it out. And a lot of my subsequent work was trying to figure out how in God's name this culture was transmitted. And, you know, looking at the human predicament, the thing that I came away with most was like, not just metaphorically, baboons were the textbook example of the inevitability of certain aspects of primate aggression and competition. And like, 
take these guys where like you found the, the first writings about them in the 60s and the the ways in which they're 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 undercurrent of aggression inevitably inevitably innately genetically forces them into a life filled with competition and violence and all of that and whoa in one generation if it turns out this distant monkey has enough neural plasticity and enough behavioral and social plasticity to pull off something like this and propagate it uh, we don't have a leg to stand on in saying there's certain inevitabilities about some of our worst human traits. So that's kind of the thing that had its biggest impact on me. It's a hopeful message. That's if good. Only if only <laughs> Maybe we go and kill the fifty percent of males who are more aggressive. Oh, that seems to be a good prescription. Well, no, maybe that might be overgeneralizing a bit, but. Yeah, if they could do it, we can sure do some surprising things with the uh, supposed things that are baked too deeply into us to ever change. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to shift to like this kind of like phase of stress and some of your some of your stuff on stress and kind of integrate it back together maybe as well. But um you know, why zebras don't have ulcers. We give this out to patients. We find that it's helpful to kind of give them some sense of like how stress is affecting them. Um, in the program that I run specifically, I run an IOP partial program. So patients come three to five days a week, three to seven hours a day, and it's group therapy and they all have a medical problem and a psychiatric problem. So what we have found is that everyone's body breaks down from stress, chronic stress in a unique way. So some people come in with chronic headaches, some people come in with chronic GI stuff, some people come in with fibromyalgia, some people come with psychogenic seizures where they're having like seizure-like events that aren't real events. Um, and so when, when, I got, when I stumbled upon your lecture maybe a decade ago, um, it was just phenomenal, really, really kind of like glued in and solidified some of this stuff for me. Um, so first of all, thank you for that. Um, and Thanks. I was thinking maybe I could have you kind of jump in. Like one of the things that really was new to me was all stress occurs in the same way, bleeding out, injured, starving, too hot, too cold. It elicits a similar response. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, it's sort of the, the stereotypy of the stress response, whether you're too hot, too cold, et cetera, et cetera. What you do is you shut down the parasympathetic nervous system. You activate the sympathetic, you activate the adrenal cortical axis, you know, gonadal steroids, you put them off until later. If there is a later growth is suppressed tissue repair, you know, this whole profile of triaging your priorities, uh, you know, get glucose out of your liver and use it now for powering your muscles, you know, make your antibodies later if there is a later. Um, this whole overall logic about built around what stress is like for 99% of vertebrates out there, which is an acute physical crisis. And everything you're doing with your body at the time is, you know, essential for life. Just you know, try running away from a lion if you've got Addison's disease that's not treated or, or Shy Drager syndrome. Whoa, it turns out we've had the elements of this probably for 150 million years because it's essential to mobilize the stress response in the face of stress as it hasn't meant for like forever for most beasts. And then we socially complex smart primates and get socialization to the point where instead we could spend our time being psychosocially stressed by each other and then the chickens come home to roost and while it's great to up your blood pressure for 40 seconds sprinting for your life doing it chronically is not such a great thing while it's like perfectly logical to like not waste energy on making B cells for the next three minutes, do it chronically and psychoneuroimmunology has its birth. And we see, you know, our primate problem, which is we just recently became smart enough. And I don't know, the last 5 million years, and we're using a very, very ancient piece of physiology completely incorrectly. And 
that's why we primates are smart enough to have chronic stress-related illnesses. So, you know, people die now of chronic stress, not not infections, right? And so it's like we have this, especially like I'm thinking about type A personalities. You talk about this, how there's this toxic hostility attribution style um, where they're constantly worried that someone's going to get them 24-7, you know? So they're imagining worlds of persecution, right? And that imagination leads to that chronic stress. Is that what you're talking about? Like that kind of example? Um, chronically perceiving challenge where there isn't, chronically perceiving th threat where there isn't, chronically perceiving yourself as helpless or hopeless, chronically being alone or perceiving yourself as being alone, which eventually becomes one and the same. And, you know, just an example of what we're dealing with, um, eventually I was looking at baboon equivalents of type A personality, what we're doing in terms of the continuum here. You're a baboon, you're sitting there minding your own business, you're half asleep, you're scratching at your toes, and your worst rival on the whole planet shows up and takes a nap 20 yards away. What do you do at that point? Do you go back to whatever you were doing because this was completely neutral? Or do you freak out at that point and stop whatever you were doing and get agitated and break branches and all? Do you perceive hostility in circumstances where it isn't. And after controlling for your dominance rank, if you were one of those baboons who saw your worst rival taking a nap as being grounds for getting all agitated and crazed, your basal cortisol, cortisol levels averaged about three times as high as the ones who said, this is not a challenge. That was, you know, that is a personality that sees menace where there isn't. And these were guys whose physiology was showing that they were paying a price for it. And wow, just like us. Just like us, right? Yeah. It's so, so, okay. And you talk about the story of dwarfism and this boy who had this um, stress related dwarfism who was, was then hospitalized and finally connected to a nurse. And he had this great connection with this nurse and he started growing and then the nurse goes away. Can you, can you tell us this story? Well, it's, it's one of the uh, sort of like epic tales in the annals of, you know, even growth hormone secretion is, is reflected in how the world seems in your mind. Yeah stress dwarfism, psychosocial dwarfism, examples of that, and astonishing ones where, you know, a trusted whoever is there for this kid who's gone through some developmental hell and finally gets there first. And nurse goes away for two weeks. And in this classic, like old study, growth hormone levels drop in the kid almost immediately. And nurse comes back from vacation and growth hormone levels start going back to normal. And wow, even the rate at which we're depositing calcium in our long bones are sensitive to how safe and, and protected we feel in this world. Do you, do you think that kind of like evidence added to your overall arcing thought about the importance of connection, the importance of having at least one person that you feel that level of connection with? Well, sure. It <laughs> kind of really hammered that one home. Um, you know, shoulders are very good to cry on, no matter how hairy they are. I don't know, that, that kind of fails as a extension there, but for both baboons and us and remarkably distant, species social support and social outlets and stuff is mighty protective so like let's say okay let's say there is someone who's listening to this professional chronically stressed because of their own internal imaginations like what um what advice do you have for them based on this research um None that's readily readily useful. Um, just because you know, 
baboons afterward they lie on questionnaires so you can't find out how they're really feeling and stuff so it's it's limited in it you know what did i come away with like you get your mantra of the the building blocks of psychosocial stress and then you got to spend a lot of time tampering your enthusiasm about it because of the subtleties yes 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 a sense of control is really protective and like if you're a monkey or a rat or a college student or any of these classic studies sense of control is very protected and dependent on whether you have control or not um with a proviso uh don't bias someone to believe they had control over something where the outcome is a disaster because you're psychologically prompting them to focus on how much better things could have been you want to instill a sense of control only for mild to moderate stressors because the psychological sort of biasing then is, whoa, look how much worse it would have been. Thank God I was at the controls throughout. In, uh, information, predictive information is hugely protective from stress and beautiful experimental demonstrations of within a narrow window if like you're getting shocks and you're a rat or human and they're unpredictable and you you know start secreting glucocorticoids in response to this whole experience give someone predictive information have a little warning like go on 10 seconds before each shock and you don't get as much of a stress response wow predictive information it's so protective all of that give somebody the warning light one second before each shock doesn't have any effect you don't have enough time to benefit from sort of the the psychological preparation give somebody a warning light a minute before each shock and you make things worse because oh wow you get a whole minute to just sit there and marinate in here it comes here it comes there's a narrow window in which information is actually helpful there's a narrow window in which social support is actually helpful and like toxic relationships and like one one of the great cliches of how like on the average marriage is good for men's health and on the average marriage is not good for women's health especially in in aged populations like be careful what the social support is you look for um you know a a superficial acquaintance acquaintanceship turns out not to be what real social support should look like for a primate and if we invest too much in that and the rug gets pulled out from under our feet uh it could seem worse than before you started so like baboons not teaching one too much about how you should have limited expectations if you spend your weekends clubbing or something like that's not necessarily going to be the route to like social support that will keep you there to your deathbed um but you know we're more complex than being helped just by mantras of get as much of a sense of control as much of a sense of predictability as get as many outlets as possible you know it's narrower ranges than that which is what a lot of the sort of behavioral endocrinology of this stuff shows you hmm there's a lot of data for depression, anxiety, mental illness on like exercise and the repetitive nature of exercise, getting stronger decreases depression more than not getting stronger. Um, there seems to be independent. Um, I've done a bunch of episodes on this, like strength training is independent of cardio. Do you think that these are working out the stress system in a predictable way? And like, I'm choosing to voluntarily do something difficult. Is that, is there part of that that's helping the stress system? yeah and some of it is the aerobic stuff and like you're expanding your diaphragm and that's doing great stuff to your vagal nerve and like nuts and bolts physiology of the beneficial effects of there but the word that's at least as important that you bring up is choice that you chose to do that again classic studies you know this was late 1950s uh you take two rats and one of them gets to run in a running wheel whenever it feels like it and the other rat is yoked 
to the first one. It is kept in a running wheel. It can't get out. And every time the first rat chooses to run, the second running wheel forces the second rat to run. They're getting the same exact aerobic exercise and they're doing the same great things to their like physiology. And yeah. the first rat does better and the second rat does worse than if he hadn't been put in that running wheel in the first place. You know, control uh, is a useful thing. And sort of ironically, um, like when you look, benefits of exercise or mental health and all of that, or benefit of all sorts of stress management techniques. Um, don't do one that makes you miserable and don't do one, no matter how many of your friends say, this is the greatest thing on earth, you know, read the fine print. Um, you know, this may not be for you. If I, I meditation does fabulous things from like, volumes worth of research and that sort of if i were to meditate 20 minutes a day for a week i would have a stroke by the end of the week it is so antithetical to what i'm about but nonetheless you know if it works for you kind of thing but if it doesn't uh that's not necessarily the therapeutic way to go yeah okay so i was pulled into this quote on depression and the vulnerability that you shared um and you talked about how you you've had episodes of depression, moments of these symptoms, and um, in the midst of it, there's this kind of uh, almost like the family can feel like a dis distraction towards the relentless pursuit of accomplishments. Um, you said, "quote Most of the time, the depression is beneath the surface, seeping swamp gas, where I suddenly keep it at bay by working." incessantly powered by ambition and willingness to view things that should matter uh, to view things that really should matter as distractions and i wonder if um one like how you've worked through this in your life um for those of us who may have a similar bent well not very insightfully, not very quickly, not with a whole lot of natural talent for seeing what needs to be done as an uphill battle all the way. Um, and thank God, eventually meeting like the love of my life and who's remarkably <laughs> like patient and, and, you know, slowly beginning to figure out there is more to life than like the length of your CV. And there's more to life than, you know, and realizing running as fast as you can on an achievement treadmill, you know, you could keep all of that you know, neurotransmitter chaos at bay for only so long you know, there's more important stuff out there. Um, and that sure was not occurring, occurring to me as a 20 year old, nor as a 40 year old, nor as a 50 year old, but it's like slowly seeped in. Okay. I was thinking about, you talk about, um, Zimbardo's Stanford prison experiment and Stanley Miller's obedience study. And the majority of the participants conforming to, you know, harmful behaviors potentially unwittingly you know you talk about like unconsciously maybe being sort of pulled into these dynamics right and um you also talk about the the importance of teaching stories and maybe teaching about these studies as well right where it's like maybe by teaching stories of heroes we can then have more power to take a stand and not just repeat history not just blindly or unconsciously end up doing or becoming part of a problem. Can you speak about that? Well, ideally, and that said, of course, the Milgram story turns out to be far more nuanced than most of us took away and the Zimbardo story more nuanced than like all those versions. And, you know, there were more people resisting than one might think from like the epic tales there were more people who thought this is just like some silly psych experiment so i'm going to be you know 
congenial here. There were more people who found Zimbardo, who's sort of a who's a colleague and friend, um, to be a very dominating presence, and that had its own effects on how the experiment ran. But nonetheless, like landmarks and showing how readily we conform and totally incredible neurobiology studies since then showing on what's going on in your head when you conform when you conform just to get along versus when you conform because you really change how you're viewing the world you know, this is very very powerful and then you know you got to take some comfort from the fact that amid that you know there's neural plasticity and baboons view the world differently when circumstances change and humans do as well and there's you know there's ex-white supremacists out there who've renounced what they've done and work for peace and there's like there's there's tourist companies i was astonished by this that specialize in taking like now elderly Vietnam War veterans for trips to Vietnam for reconciliation ceremonies. And there's, you know, there's room for hope, there's room for change. And if you are completely mechanistic and you're thinking about how we work as like organisms made out of molecules and atoms and things like that, parentheses, one in which free will is a pretty dubious concept um if you think that way and you begin to learn about how our brains change what you come away with is being vastly impressed with our potential for that and like how we're using some of the exact same like kinases in our brain that a sea slug does when it's learning to view the world differently you know there's a great deal of potential for change and I guess folks in your business get up every morning with your motivations predicated by that notion. Um, and of course, you know, there's double edged swords and that same sort of neuroplasticity is how we learn how to hate someone who we didn't before or decide a group of thems are threatening you. So like, yeah, we change. There's cool stuff. Like we, express trophic factors that we weren't doing this morning because of experience and you know that isn't necessarily a panacea um so be careful how one exploits that but yeah very little in us set in stone for better or worse so okay jumping to these these thoughts on um determinism specifically you talk about how you wouldn't believe in free will unless someone were to show you a neuron that is firing by itself with no environmental influences with nothing preceding it right is that a good summation of how you define what you would need to believe in free will but then well, you say we're not going to look for that if 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 i'm trying to be a like total pain in the ass and and you know oppositional <laughs> or whatever I believe there's no free will whatsoever. I believe when you study enough biology, it's absolutely clear. When you study enough about how biology interacts with environment, it's absolutely clear. I'm on a soapbox about how there is no free will and we have to fundamentally trash most of our assumptions about human behavior and transform society and all of that. And then like, someone says okay so how are you defining free will and it's usually a compatibilist philosopher who's very <laughs> much in disagreement with me about every step of the way and the impossible like high bar that i set is okay you just did a behavior good bad ambiguous in between whatever and like you're wondering why that behavior occurred and like here are the four motor neurons that told your muscles to do that just now show me that those neurons would have done the exact same thing no matter what else the rest of your 800 billion neuron 80 billion neurons in there were doing and show me those neurons would have done the exact same thing regardless of whether you were stressed or sleep deprived or finding love at that moment and regardless of what your hormone levels were last night and regardless of whether you like found god in the last three months or 
develop PTSD. And regardless of what adolescence was like for you with finishing off your frontal cortex and your childhood and your fetal life and your genes and the culture your ancestors handed to you and the way you were raised, and change every single one of those and show me that those neurons would have done the exact same thing then that they did. And as far as I'm concerned, you've just proven there's free will and you can't do it because <laughs> there's nothing you can't. Okay. Own. Okay. Let's wait for Neuralink to get established. Okay. Because then we'll have like <laughs> electrodes in the brain. We'll have a bunch of electrodes. Right. We can see what's happening. Right. Right. And we can all be like Elon. Um, yeah. Okay. But, but isn't that like, okay. 86 billion neurons, some with 10,000 connections. I mean, isn't the isn't the sum greater than the parts right and so of like, course we have this enormous complexity it's like how do you define like I'll, I'll give you i'll give you a molecule of of h2o and show me <laughs> prove to me that there's wetness from just looking at this one molecule yeah we we've just entered this world that is up and upended like dead white male reductive science and which is, if you want to understand something complex, it isn't necessarily the case to break it down into its component parts and understand its, each little itty bitty building block and then just add them back up together and you'll understand the system. No, you got non-linearities, you got non-additive stuff, you got chaotic emergent complexity and stuff that is like beyond cool in terms of how it explains how all of our brains are wired up roughly the same but never identically and things that it's totally interesting and i love that stuff and it forces like a more integrative level of doing your like biology than everyone used to think was essential and oh, that's it but that sure as hell ain't where you're going to find free will because every attempt to somehow wave your hands and get free will out of chaoticism or emergent complexity or quantum indeterminacy or stuff every single time when you look closely enough there's a step in there that requires you to say and then magic happens it doesn't really work dr okay. sapolsky correct me if i'm wrong but i feel like your opinion has somewhat changed over time um now you're saying you know that basically there's not like you don't have a shred of free will but before i think you were willing to say that you know or, or concede that you could choose between two t-shirts do you feel like that we have the choice to choose between two t-shirts in the morning or no no nah, I, I was being a polite dinner guest at the time when i was saying stuff like that i was about 14 when i decided there's no free will whatsoever and like have been discovering since then how unpalatable it is to like try to <laughs> except that for most people and thus in effect what my soundbite is is if you've got to cling to a belief that like people are their their sources of agency and all of that and you want to do it for explaining t-shirt choices go for it be happy you know that's just fine but when it comes to important stuff like judging somebody's behavior or deciding whether or not you feel like you are entitled to something or whether you feel justified to hate someone or not, um, then you should probably do the heavy lifting and figure out how things are actually working then. Okay. But, let me, let me, let me run a scenario by you. Okay. Okay. So you're, you're in a, you're at like a New York subway, someone falls in. Okay. And you know that you can jump down and get them and you can save their life. And you could probably jump out too, because you're athletic, let's say, <laughs> but you also hear the train coming. And so there's a part of your brain that is like self-preservation and it is screaming at you. Don't do anything, freeze, don't move. But there's another quiet area. Maybe it's the clan affiliation, you know, it's a stranger, but it's like, it's a, it's a softer voice, right? So I, I almost feel like, don't we have the ability to choose which part we want to amplify and which part we want to quiet? Nah, not for a second. Um, because you, two people are standing there and one of them may jump and the other not. 
and you'll say, whoa, well, what was that about? What was your, and they're different people. And it is a world of biology over which they had no control, interacting with environment over which they had no control, which brought them to that moment. And, you know, it's not by chance that whatever it is you just did, monumental or trivial, it's not by chance that it happened because all you are is the end product of everything that came before. And we all had very different came befores than each other. Okay. And that's okay. really the, um, you know, the, the purview of, of behave, which is like a 700 page treatise on where intent comes from. Exactly. And which, you know, uh, summarize it if you want to understand where behavior comes from you got to think about you know ion currents one second before in the person's limbic system and evolution and everything in between because all of it is where <laughs> where was was and what we are now is the end product of that and you're going to get nowhere if you think you have identified the area of the brain that explains everything or the neurotransmitter or the gene or the developmental experience or whatever. It's, we are the end product of everything that came before and astonishingly unlikely, subtle, subliminal, distal, unimaginable things turn out to have played very large roles in making us who we are. I, I guess I guess it's hard for me to disconnect like a sense of agency, free will from other concepts that we would say like, yeah, the brain is actually part of that process, like self-control, rational choice, planning behavior, active choice, regulatory behavior, you know, like regulation. And I was thinking about specifically like borderline personality disorder, which I would agree that there's an environmental component and there's a genetic component, right? And the, the people like, as you go further back in their history, the effect size decreases. So for example, if they have attachment disorganization, the effect size is like 0.2. If they have maltreatment, the effect size is like 0.2 to more likely to have borderline personality disorder. If, if they're, if they had maternal hostility at 42 months, the effect size is like 0.42. If they have emotional dysregulation at 12 years of life, it, the effect size jumps to like 1.4. And, you know, this is looking at people that are have borderline personality disorder that are 28 years old. And so, like, I concede with you that there's a genetics, there's environment that lead to this diagnosis. Right. But then there's there's a thing of like, OK, now are they stuck there? You know, can they make ch a choice to change their environment? But I guess you would just say it as like, OK, I, I think no, <laughs> they can't. They cannot make a choice to change their environment. When our behavior changes, it's because the circumstances that have put us into that moment make us more or less amenable to being changed by that moment. And not for a second does that do in, you know, the notion that like what you do for a living, which is help people to be healthier mentally, psychiatrically, biologically um that's totally compatible with it but um we're not choosing we're the end product of circumstances that allowed us to be changed by whatever the circumstance is or has made us exactly the sort of person who isn't going to be influenced by that circumstance let me further specify just 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 because some people may not have understood that right i'm not saying like a kid can change their environment but now this 28 year old can change their environment by getting therapy, getting into a partial program. It, it may take years, right? But there's studies that show that people can then get to a place where they don't suffer from chronic suicidality, emotional dysregulation. And so that's where I was saying, like, I think if, if presented like, Hey, this is the, this is actually the path out. A lot of people take that path. Isn't that a choice to take that path though? Um, no, it's a hell of a lot of luck. Um, and all you have to do is look at the oceans of people who are treatment resistant with their depressions or look at people where you could do, do like the best 
cognitive behavioral therapy out the wazoo, and that's someone who it doesn't penetrate on. What we see here is, I, I think at the deeper level, where we would both agree, is the last thing on earth that it means that this is a deterministic universe and we are biological creatures and and all that the last thing on earth that that means is things cannot change and it certainly does not mean the next step which is you should not attempt to try changing things because why bother when you study the mechanisms by which we change and things change and neurons change and ion channels change and societies change all it does is reinforce that much more that there are mechanistic underpinnings to it and sometimes the way you access it is by stopping somebody's serotonin reuptake and sometimes the way you access it by spending hours and hours listening to someone and those are equally biological and those are equally interacting with environment and all of those are just ways of accessing that like nervous systems change change happens but you don't sit there and decide that's it i'm going to change because you can't will yourself to have willpower you got to be lucky enough to have like the the neurons lined up in a way so that the right circumstances can change you there was this time post covid where i was i was absolutely exhausted of working out of the garage i think it was you know florida 110 degrees here humid and so i started going to a gym and i got a, a coach and it's like it's the change that i needed now i would say of course i'm fortunate to be able to afford a coach fortunate to know which coach to get fortunate enough to do it but it's like i i don't, I don't know i think there's something about like yeah when we get stuck as humans we can uniquely okay like I imagine like there's a deterministic chessboard that we're playing, which is life. And we all have like slightly different rules, but the moves, but there are moves that we can take. Right. And if you look out a chessboard into the distant future, there's like, not just there, there's a, a thou, like hundreds of thousands of options. Right. It's like the further you get out, it's like infinite options. Um, but you would say that, the rule the, you would restrict the rules down very very close where it's like you know you got one piece you're moving and it only moves one location is that correct that's correct um but one of the mechanistic pieces to work into that is sometimes a sense of control and agency can be really really helpful and protective and it's not by chance that most people like reflexively like the idea of being captains of their ship you know, that's a good therapeutic tool. Sometimes like hitting somebody over the head can shape their behavior, even if there's no ethical rationale for thinking that blame and punishment are moral goods. Sometimes, yeah, it's a good thing in some circumstances to emphasize to people that things can change, that they can have control over it, not because they really can, but because in the right individuals, that will facilitate the sort of change you're looking for. Um, but don't try that with someone who's homeless. Don't try that with a refugee. Don't try that with someone who's dying of terminal cancer. Um, don't teach people that they can control circumstances where in fact there is no malleability. That's not therapeutic solace. That's the exact opposite. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you have to take a different, different approach. If someone is on their deathbed, it's like how do how do you help them connect with their family? Maybe find meaning in their in their life, or you know, it's like very different situation. Then you know, there are some things that they can not control at all. Death may be inevitable. Um, although there's a lot of people that probably try to convince you that oh i have the magic bullet take this diet and this death will not happen right there's a lot of people that prey on watch vulnerable. your wallet yep yeah i feel like the wealthier you are the more they the more people want to pray too so <laughs> well i live very close to silicon valley which 
has now become the the world's epicenter of now aging dot com gazillionaires funding gerontology research and chronobiology and and you know cryogenics and such and you know doesn't matter how many like <laughs> third homes you've gotten up in the mountains or whatever your telomeres are going to shorten and your memory is probably going to get crappy and at some point you're made of the same stuff as everyone else and so it's it's fascinating watching the the masters of the universe here in silicon valley trying to deal with that one it's a very good time to be a gerontology researcher if you happen to be in these parts of the world because they're pouring money into all sorts of crackpot institutes but yes reality can be kept at bay for only so long so you know if we accept your central thesis that if there is determinism there's basically no room for morality do you do you believe that i believe that deeply that is an intellectual foundation of my life it is a moral imperative for me and i can actually function that way about one percent of the time yeah <laughs> this is hard this is an uphill battle like people piss you off and it's very hard to go through oh but how do they get that way and all we are is the end product of all the biological that person just pissed me off and and vladimir putin appears to be a jerk and even more corrosively 99 percent of the time if someone says to me wow nice job on that i feel good what a flaming hypocrite i had no control i have earned nothing i deserve no we feel good about that we feel angry we feel judgmental we blame we praise we do all of that and the vast majority of the time um that is very very imbued in us but you know we're about three centuries past the point where it felt obvious and intuitively just self-evident that some people should be slaves or it's possible for satan to demonically possess you and that's why you're having seizures and whoa we eventually learned that what was intuitively obvious then isn't really how the world works and even though it may seem intuitively obvious now that all sorts of people for whom things have not turned out well in life had control for it to have turned out differently we're going to figure out at some point that that's not the case either. And if we can only do it 1% of the time, try to do that hard lifting when you're sitting on a jury or yelling at your kid or deciding that you deserve a higher salary or any such thing. And, yep. you know, no one says it's easy, but that's where it matters. I And I, I come back to, like, I think that the humility and the intellectual conclusion that you come to gives a humility that despite your success you know you're no better than a janitor you're no better than anyone and i go what were you, you reacted to that you agree yeah we should I, all aim for that and i failed dismally most of the time because you know i'm like fragile and a person in my time and place like anyone else and like no one says it's easy to realize none of us <laughs> deserve anything more than anyone else does and hating someone makes as little sense as hating a an earthquake and because we're all yeah it's not going to be easy but like every step along the way in history where we've been able to subtract out responsibility laden with moral judgment uh the world's become a more humane place so we got to keep trying to do that mothers don't really cause schizophrenia because they've got psychodynamic bile running through them and you know each one of those aha i had no idea biology had something to do with that breakthroughs the world becomes like a better place to live in awesome um Dr. Sapolsky, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Sure. I, hope, I hope you'll think about coming back on another time. Uh, my um, pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. Alex, thanks for uh, working with me on this.
And, Thank you uh, both. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Have a great day. And um, I will not keep you longer than your time allows. So well, thanks. Have a good day too. Take okay. care, guys. Take Bye. care. Bye.